Yeah, so I think the first thing, if you're a high school kid right now and your whole job and focus is to just go get NIL money, you're going to be miserable and you're probably not going to find the right fit. You know, that is going to come down the road. Let the big schools handle that. You know what I mean? They're, they're going to take care of you when you get there. But NIL is more of just like it, sh- it started as, hey, if you use my picture, I should get a couple bucks for that. You know, where it's turned into literally these guys and girls are celebrities, right? Um, but I think... You are listening to the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast, transforming athletes into leaders on and off the court with host Coach Furtado. Coaches, are you ready to take your passion for coaching and turn it into a full-time career? I know the challenge is firsthand, but the Make Money Coaching Sports program helped me take BTG basketball full-time. If you're tired of juggling coaching part-time and want to fully focus on doing what you love, This business accelerator will give you the tools and support to make it happen. Hit the link in the show notes below to learn more and start living your dream. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast. Today, I have a returning guest, one of our favorites on the show, Coach Ron Bernick. Ron is the founder and CEO of Hot Corner Athletics. Uh, Ron took the vision and made it a reality by opening Hot Corner in Getzville, New York. Since then, he has worked with over 100 MLB draft picks, and Hot Corner has trained over 475 players that have reached the collegiate levels in baseball, softball, and more. And he's also a scout for USA Baseball and more. But before I even welcome you to the show, I just want to touch that that Ron is doing so much more than just getting these athletes to college and getting a few of them into the professional, into the, becoming MLB players, right? It's about so much more than that. It's about beyond the scoreboard, and we're going to dive into that. So welcome back to the show, Ronnie. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. The new branding, by the way, is awesome. I love it. I know last time I was on here was a little different, so I... I... I got to see this on social kind of unfold and I'm, I'm happy for you. I mean, I know we talked a little bit off air, but like, I love seeing guys do well and chase their passion and, you know, even talking to you about kind of where I'm so happy. Appreciate that. Appreciate you have, having you on. And I think that's a great place to be in and to start. And so talking about beyond the scoreboard, right. And I want to really talk to you and give you an opportunity to, to share what hot corner athletics all about, what you're all about and really making an impact on kids lives beyond the scoreboard. Yeah, so, I, you know, it's it's funny because when you think about, like, a mission statement that every business has, um, you know, it's like you try to find a one-liner, but then, like, I like to talk. So, for me, it was, like, <laughs> a page long, and I, I think the word impact is literally – it sums everything up. I think impact is what we're trying to do. And does that mean that some guys or girls are going to be professionals? Yeah. Does it mean that some kids are just going to try and make their high school team? Absolutely. Does it mean that we could go into a high school and give a kid just a better experience with the sport in general because they're on the fence? Yes. So as we've evolved, you know, I've made so many good decisions. I've made so many mistakes in my career as a, as a coach and an entrepreneur. And I think the one thing that is I've really learned is that I just want to meet people where they're at. I want to give them a great experience. And I just want to know that when they're done with us and they move on to whatever the next phase in their, is in their life, that I'm always available as a resource, as a friend, as a colleague, whatever my role is in their life, I just want to maximize that role. And I, and it's, it, that is not how it was when I started, you know, it was, it was very transactional when I started, I was trying to, I was trying to grind. I was trying to make it work, you know, and The more I do this and the longer I go, I realize that like the impact word, like it literally is something I like tattoo on my body, you know, because impact to me means that I lived out my life mission. I help people. And does that, I still got to put food on my table. I got three kids. I got a lot I got to take care of, you know, but that's not the reason why I do it. And I think it's really hard at times when you're running a business or, you know, there's a transaction at the end of a session or there's a transaction at the end of a month or something like that. It's really hard to look past that. And I, I, every time I talk on a podcast, it's literally the only thing I talk about because I don't care about the money. It's either going to come or it's not. But let's say it does. Great. I can continue to impact people. Let's say it doesn't. Okay, great. I impacted as many people as I could during the time that I did it. And that is the way that I literally operate on a daily basis. And it's opened up new ideas. 
But now I'm not as focused on the one or two major leaguers that we have or had or going to have. You know, I'm focused on the hundred percent of people that I get to come in contact with. You know, their experience matters just as much as anybody else. Absolutely. And so I'll kind of share recently, I kind of had a similar epiphany, right? And I just remembering like, why did I even get into this in the first place? Right. It was literally simply like I got into coaching basketball when I was working at a boys and girls club. And all I wanted to do is be a positive role model. And as a business owner, we can kind of get caught up in the numbers. Like you're talking about, whether you're talking dollar signs or you're comparing yourself to other, uh, you know, programs in the area of like number of kids you're serving. And then I really had to re remind myself, like, why am I, I'm in this to make an impact with each kid in each session. And so kind of while we're on that, that, you know, topic, I want to, you know, you talked about you just want to provide a great experience, right, and be them, there for them throughout their life. Well, let's talk about the great experience. And what do you feel like includes what or what does Hot Corner Athletic include in their experience for athletes? Yeah, I mean, so like from the the nuts and bolts of it, like we have a, a pretty big weight room. We have multiple strength coaches. We have every piece of technology that you could possibly want for tracking data and helping kids improve. Um, we have coaches that specialize in their specific skills. I have inner body composition testing units. I have speed testing units, jumping testing units, power units. I literally all of it. So when you're talking about just the nuts and the bolts of a facility, uh, there really isn't a lot of places out there that have, you know, what we're able to provide. But more importantly, when I hire the 15 people that you see when you walk in the door are there to literally make sure that you enjoy yourself. And I'm going to do my job. You are going to get better. You're paying us money to get better. That is the transactional side of it. You're paying me for a service. I'm going to provide the best service I can give you. But what I don't get paid for and how we hire at Hawk Corner is we're just going to hire really good people that genuinely care about you. I'm on the phone until one o'clock in the morning sometimes with a kid that had a bad outing on the mound at his college and just got chewed out by his coach and just needs somebody to talk to. I don't get paid for that. I don't want to get paid for that. I just want to be there for you because I know at the end of the day, when you are done playing and you move on to have a family, you're going to always look back and be like, man, that, that guy gave me that guy's there for me. If I called him 10 years from now, he would answer the phone. That's who I want to be. And I had to be very careful on how you hire. So I have really good staff that genuinely cares about people. But we're so lucky that we have all the, you know, stuff. You know, we have the stuff. But but we're just, we're good dudes. And that's what you're going to get. Whether you're seven years old or whether you're trying to sign a professional contract, you're going to get the service that you need. But I want that seven-year-old to know that just as much as I care about his baseball playing abilities or his other things that he's doing, I, I want to know, like, if he likes video games, like, I want to be able to relate to him. What, game, what video game do you like? I'm not going to sit there and downplay the, the fact that the kid plays video games for four hours a day. Look at Ninja. He makes a half a million dollars a year playing video games. I don't know what a kid's life is going to end up and what he's going to do. So why in the world would I discredit a kid's dream? I get to chase mine every day. So when you come into our place, we're just going to help you chase that, whatever it is. And I'm probably going to try to put you in front of people that are going to help you chase it. And that's, I think, the impact that we're trying to make greater than just be on the sport. 100%. And so kind of continuing on that and continuing on our conversation that we had off air, you know, you kind of talked about between both of us, right, there probably would be less than 5% would play collegiately and then, or maybe not 5%, but definitely professionally, right? At the end of the day, they're going to hang up their baseball cleats or their basketball shoes probably sometime, before, most likely before they're 25, right? Yep. The rare few will get to play a little bit longer, but that's very rare. So most of the kids we get to serve, um, are, are, you know, it's they're playing, they, they're part of, this is part of their enrichment experience, their academic experience, their just youth development experience. And one thing that I really like that you said is just, finding, helping them find what they want to chase. Can you elaborate kind of what you meant by that? Yeah. I mean, I, I obviously am going to have my first initial impact on you in the sport of baseball, right? right. It could be, you just got cut from your JV team and you want to make varsity next year. It could be that you're a junior in high school and you want to play collegiately. That's, that's the entry, right? They're, the barrier of entry is baseball and softball. Um, in our weight room, the barrier of entry is just sport in general or physical fitness in general, right? But once you're in, 
like we talk so much about relationship building. You know, if you're going to really get a kid to listen to you about baseball, you have to know about their life. You got to know how they tick. You know, are they a visual learner? Are they a, you know, do they like to read books? Do, are they going to learn by watching YouTube? Um, are they going to learn by watching their own video? What do they do when they're not playing baseball, softball, lacrosse, or whatever else they're doing? What are they doing? You know, if there's somebody that like loves playing video games, they're probably going to really learn by watching video. So I'm not going to sit there and bash the kid because he plays video games. I'm going to say, ah, there's my ticket in to help them learn more about their swing. If I just show them something visually, they might do pretty well here. And that takes all of the ego out of it because I could very easily be the coach that's like, you need to, you need to cut out 45 to an hour of video games a night and you need to put that into doing push-ups and sit-ups. Well, that's not what he wants to do. So, you know, we can be realistic with them and say, hey, listen, like the professional athletes are training baseball eight hours a day. Okay. So if you're not doing that, you're probably not on the trajectory to be a professional athlete, but that's a, just a stat, you know, but when you're talking to a kid and developing a relationship with them, it's really trying to figure out how they tick. And then when you figure out how they tick and how they operate and what their home life is like and how their parents operate and how they're raised, you can create a good, a good relationship with them and then learn what they want to do. So for me, it's like I tell people all the time, even in our facility, it's like, do you think this facility just got here because I woke up one day with a lot of a lot of cash and just was able to open it up? Like, no, I have so much more of a passion for the sport that like I was willing to lose money to put this up or I was willing to go and make an investment to make this happen, to provide my passion, which is to impact kids in our sport, right? And so when I say that, it's like, but baseball's mine. That's my outlet. That's what I chose. But that doesn't mean that you have to choose that. So for as long as you decide to play baseball, I will give you the best experience possible. But when you're ready to chase something in life, I also want you to be able to come to me and let's talk about that too. You want to go be a math teacher? Great. Let's figure out how we can get you an extra step for math. And then we can still do this once or twice a week. But like, let's get you into that because that's what you're passionate about. You're going to crush it. Right. And that's where I'm happy. Like, I would love to be, call you and say, hey, man. Why don't you convert over and be a really good baseball coach? Because you're a really good coach. Why don't you figure out baseball? Like, you like basketball. So, for me, it's like, I just want to see you crush it and what you want to do. I'm not trying to change who you are because of what I want, right? I'm trying to make you the best that you can in our relationship so that you can go and chase what you want. And that's where I think we can do that with 13-year-old kids. You can do that with high school kids. You know, they still have dreams, but why don't they chase them a lot of times? Because they're told that they have to do something else, and I get it. I'm a parent. Like some parents are probably like, I really want my kid to be a doctor because it's going to set them up for life. and They're not going to struggle like I did. Yeah. But do you want your kid to be miserable as a doctor? Or you want them to be happy doing something that they love. And so that's what I try to figure out. What do they love? You know, I love baseball. I watch every single major league game on TV every single night. That's what I like to do. But that doesn't make you wrong because you don't like to do that either. I love that. Yeah. You, you're helping them find their passion. And honestly, I'd say like 50% of the phone calls that I have with parents, like they just love that their kid loves basketball. They're, they're so yeah. happy that they're passionate about basketball. It's less about like them and, and their trajectory. They're just happy that they're doing, they, they want to do something on a Friday night. That's not go out and do the other things that other high school athletes are doing or not high school athletes, but high school students are doing right. As, as me and you both know, and the, the listeners know, and that that's what it's all about is, finding and igniting that and then obviously sports whether it's basketball or baseball like I, baseball was a very important part of my life for all the way up until 18 and I'm a diehard A's fan and now it's just I'm an athletics fan not a not an Oakland fan anymore but um you know like that that becomes a part of you and it makes you feel like you belong somewhere which is just so yep. important yep but you didn't chase baseball because your your big passion is basketball Right. Somebody could have somebody could have messed that up at some point. Right. You know, but you may have had a coach that helped you chase your dream. You know, you may have believed in listening to yourself. Like I know for me, I'm very internally motivated. I chase what I want, yeah. you know, but there's some people that aren't like that, you know? So it's like, how do you find what, what, how they tick? And I'm so incredibly passionate about that as a coach. I love that. As far as, you know, kind of going to deviate for one question as, as a business owner myself, as, I, as I'm starting the hiring process, I'm really focusing on finding coaches who care as well. I'm just curious how you really instill that relationship building as an important pillar to Hot Corner Athletics and how you develop your coaches. 
Yeah, so it started, and this is where my a few of my failures have been. Like, I it started where I wanted to just hire people that have played at a very high level, right. and that's what I was chasing. And so I'd bring in these guys that were like super high level dudes that just didn't really have a care or love for coaching. Right. And so they were really good players, but then when they would go to coach, it was like, it wasn't being given to the kids the way that it should have been. And so I, I kind of changed and I said, you know what, what if I find somebody that's just passionate about baseball that I can teach how to be a good coach because people like what I teach. So maybe if I just teach them to understand how I go about it, they can learn. And I'll tell you, I mean, it's been unbelievable, the transformation. Cause like you, you hire some guys that might not be the greatest off the rip, but when they learn like what they're passionate about and what they're good at, you know, and who they relate the best with, like, that's really fun to watch, you know? And, and as you hire, you find guys that are very outgoing at first and you find guys that aren't as outgoing and I think being able to get them to just trust who they are and just be who they are, you can find the right kids for them too. And that's part of how we, how we onboard. Like part of our onboarding with guys is putting them in uncomfortable situations and just seeing how they respond. You know, like if you think about a winter day at Hot Corner Athletics, I mean, the music's blasting. You know, we have, we have a different music going on in the gym versus our, our field house area. And you know, it's loud. We got 90 kids in there, you know, some parents are staying, whatever. Um, but it's loud. And so if you're somebody who's a little bit more quiet and I never put you through an uncomfortable situation, how in the world are you going to be able to perform? So for me, it's more of like, let's just put you in an uncomfortable environment and then you may fail, but I'm not going to fire you. I'm just going to guide you through it. That's all. And you're going to evolve as a person because just as much as I want the kids to evolve, I want my coaches to evolve too you know, in whatever industry they decide to go, you know, if it's, you know, I have a kid right now that we just hired recently. Awesome kid. He used to train with us. He's a really, really good kid. And he's going to school to be an athletic director. And he comes from a small town and he comes from a small school and he was kind of the guy and he's a little bit more quiet. Right. But he wants to be an athletic director. So he's going to have to learn how to really get his voice heard at some point, if that's what he wants to do. And so what a better place to learn than a really loud baseball facility that has music blaring. You're going to have to project your voice. Always remember the stuff that he learned with us. And I think that is so valuable so that he actually got something out of a previous job instead of getting something out of, you know, oh, yeah, I just coached baseball for two years, but it really didn't help me become an athletic director. So that's where my passion goes into when I hire, if that makes sense. No, hundred percent. And, and and that kind of goes with the same philosophy with the kids as it does with the coach, right? What's their, what are they passionate about? What's their traje- trajectory? Now, how, as I, as a leader, can I help them develop their leadership in whatever kind of skill sets they need to go be an athletic director, you know, go be an athletic trainer, go be a PT, whatever it ends up being, right? Helping them give them an experience that gives them the tools they need to then success you know, be successful later on, um, which I really like. And so kind of with that pivoting back into our conversation, and I really like how we started with the fund. I feel like as the fundamentals of coaching is just like really caring about kids and then the relationship building side of things. But now we kind of want to talk about, um, you know, your thoughts on, I know you work with a lot of athletes who are, have college aspirations and we have athletes as well that are in that. And then as we both know, as we kind of discussed before, the NIL and the transfer portal has really made it a lot more challenging for high school athletes to come out and get a Division Two or Division One right away. So can you kind of elaborate? Number one, we'll start with how do we be, how do we prepare athletes to really be college ready? Yeah, so I think the first thing, if you're a high school kid right now and your whole job and focus is to just go get NIL money, you're going to be miserable and you're probably not going to find the right fit. You know, that is going to come down the road. Let the big schools handle that. You know what I mean? They're they're going to take care of you when you get there. But NIL is more of just like it, sh- it started as, hey, if you use my picture, I should get a couple bucks for that. You know, where it's turned into literally these guys and girls are celebrities, right? Um, but I think... Before I get deep into that, you want to start at the foundation of a high school kid. And, and you got to remember now with, with a college coach, like here's why I look at it. They got to put food on the table for their family too, right? 
and unfortunately, the athletic director at that school is going to monitor that by the relationships that they carry with their players and how much they win. So if they're in a win now mentality, they may not be able to have as many projects as they used to. I was a project. I was just able to have four years to figure it out. And so, yeah, they're going to look at the transfer portal because they have to win right now. Otherwise, they're not going to have a job. So you may want to put on the Alabama uni or the UCLA uni, but that coach wants to keep that uni on. He doesn't want to lose that position, which means that if you're in high school, you have to basically be ready as if you're a sophomore in college. And if you're not, or junior, and if you're not, it may not be a bad option to go to a junior college or a smaller school and develop and find a coach that's going to help you develop so that by the time you have a chance to get to the school that you want, you're ready. So if you're a high school kid that really has aspirations of playing collegiately, you cannot look at yourself as I'm just a high school player anymore. You have to look at yourself as I'm not only competing with the rest of the country when it comes to my athletic ability, my my athleticism, um, my skills, my strength, my power, my speed, my academics. I also have to look at like, okay, those kids that are two years older than me, three years, four years older than me. What are they doing on a daily basis to get the same scholarship I'm looking for? And that's how colleges look at it. I'm going to go take a high school kid now. That means I'm taking one less guy from the transfer portal, you know, or like some schools will just give all their scholarship money to the portal and then you'll be a preferred walk on. Now it's going to cost you $60,000 a year to go to school when you could just go to a junior college, play for a really good coach and develop and then get to the same position in two years. So look at where your current situation is at. Realize that there's so many different ways to get there and it doesn't have to be right now. You're playing the long game. You know, if you're in high school, you're not playing a short game anymore. It's not get to Division One, stay there for four years. You're playing a long game. Continue to learn to develop. Find coaches that are going to help you develop, and then it will happen for you. But that should be the chase. It should never, never be the name on the front of the jersey or, you know, the the money that you're going to get. It's always about constantly developing and becoming not only a better athlete but a better version of yourself as well in the process. And so, you know, yes, there's there's way more kids going to junior college, right? But like, here's the flip side of it. You're also spending way less money to develop. So go find somebody that's going to help you get better. Now you got a shot. You know, I always look at, you know, baseball is my thing. So last year, University of Connecticut um, either made it to the College World Series or, you know, lost in the Super Regional. I can't fully remember exactly how far they made it. But they had nine guys on their roster that contributed heavily, that started all of their careers at the Division Three level. That's the University of Connecticut baseball program that was one of the top 16 teams in the country at the end of the year. Nine guys. That's all that can play on a, on a field at one time is nine dudes, right? And they had nine guys on their roster, some of them being pitchers, you know, that, that massively contributed to their success and start there. You know, so yes, Division One would be really cool out of high school, but Division One sitting for two years and not developing is not very cool. So go somewhere where you can get better. And then all those opportunities are going to happen for you. Look at Josh Allen. Look at all these guys that play professionally right now that weren't the top prospect out of high school, that weren't highly drafted, that weren't guys that peep their five-star recruits that had just put their head down, did the dark work, you know, got in the gym at five o'clock in the morning, allowed everybody to tell them no, and still made it where they wanted to make it because they just didn't quit. And that's what I learned and I continue to learn when I talk to coaches is I don't know when you're going to be ready. I'll call you when you're ready. I don't know when it's going to be. But don't quit just because it didn't happen for you in high school, especially if you love it. You know, Find somewhere where you're going to get better. Continue to chase it. Now, on the flip side of that, the better you do get, the more opportunities you now have to make some money in your sport. You know, So if you're somebody that is like, hey, you know what? I grew up in a trailer or I grew up in the hood or I grew up somewhere where – and we didn't have a lot of money, cool. Use that as a way to continue to motivate you. You know, Use it as a way to continue to push you forward. And if you get to the point where you've earned it, you know, you may have an opportunity to make some money in the sport now too because you know, you've, you've earned it. So there's so many chances for kids to have success now, but it's really about figuring out you know, when. You know, for me, I would have never been a Division I athlete if, if it was like it was now. I would have been a junior college guy, and who knows, I might have gone to the same school. I might have gone somewhere better. I might not have. I have no idea. 
you know, but I know that I definitely wouldn't have been a division one athlete at the high school because I was a project and it took me years to get ready. Um, but that's why I want those guys, those guys and girls to think about is just not even focusing on like the, just right now it's where do you want to be in three or four years, you know, and wherever you're supposed to be in that process, that will happen for you. You just got to keep going. I really like what you're saying there. So to me, to kind of summarize, it's like, where are the best development opportunities and be patient, right? Be patient. I feel like there's this, you know, obviously, I, and I'm sure you see it in baseball. I see it all the time in basketball um, is, you know, they players love to be recruited and then post who is recruiting them. You know, like I went on this off or I got this verbal offer or I went and toured here and I post, you know, I post their logo, right? And it may be like way out of their league, right? Like I've seen so many players in the Los Angeles basketball community, a lot of high level players, they'll post, you know, the USC's and the UCLA's and then end up going to Nevada or somewhere like that's that's smaller, which is fine, right? But I feel like a lot of times it's like we want to be a part of these big programs um, for the kind of the external reasons um, for that validation, not even necessarily because it's best for us. And that's the hardest conversation to have with a 16 year old yeah. is do you really want to look at what's best for you or do you want to look at what everybody else's perception is going to be of you? Right. You know, and, and the more you talk about the mind game and literally stuff beyond the scoreboard is what, what, what's going to be success for you internally. What's going to actually make you happy is going to Nevada and starting for four years going to make you happy or is going to USC and being a bench player for four years going to make you happy. Everybody's different. But I know me, I like playing baseball, which means I would like to be on the field. So instead of me going and sitting at the University of Pittsburgh, I'm going to go to Canisius College and I'm going to try and play every day because that's going to make me happier because I want to try and be, I want to contribute to our success. I don't want to just be a piece of the puzzle for practice, you know? And so I think that's where you really got to look within and that's going to help drive your decision. You know, Instagram's cool. You know, the 500 likes is cool for one night and then reality hits and it's like, oh yeah, you know, I committed to USC. But then you go and watch USC commit a portal guy that's the same position that just scored 20 a game in the same league. It's like, okay, well, where's your spot going to be now? You know, because they just went and got the guy that's going to take your job. They just have you as a piece in case he gets hurt. You know, so I think like looking at a outside perspective or kind of looking at it from the top view and figuring out you know, why is this opportunity even in front of me? Like, am I really going to be a guy or should I go somewhere and get better for a year or two before I actually am a guy? You know, because really all it takes is one good year. You know, look at, look at uh, Daniels, look at the former quarterback from LSU. I mean, he went to Arizona, I believe Arizona state, Arizona state. state. Yeah. Mike did not have a good career there. Like, did not have a good career. But he worked, and he kept getting better. And then goes to LSU and is a dude. Then goes second overall in the draft, and he's in the conversation for MVP right now. So those three years that he was at Arizona State didn't define what he was going to become in the NFL. He just put his head down and got to work. You know, so when you look at his situation, or that's at the highest level, obviously, but then you look at some other situations, like the UConn situation, like – Happens everywhere. You could go to Arizona State, be okay, Portal LSU, be the second second draft pick in the country. You know, you could go to a Division three school in a random part of, you know, Maine or Connecticut. Two years later, you might be at the University of UConn trying to play in the College World Series. It, it, that's where bet on yourself. So even if you don't get to where you want to be out of high school, bet on yourself, bet on your training, continue to put your head down and get to work, and it will happen. A hundred percent. And I kind of, when, when a high schooler is looking for, you know, that program to help them develop, what should they be looking for? What's kind of that process, right? Cause it has to be, there's gotta be a lot of outreach. I think a lot of times, you know, and I'm sure you see this with, with your players. It's like the players expect to post a couple, you know, videos on Instagram and the coaches are going to come to you unless you're probably top 1%. Like that's really not, not the case. So can you kind of talk through some of the strategies of how to number one, get your name out there, but also finding the right programs to develop yourself um, collegially. Yeah. So number one team wise too. Number one is figuring out what matters for you. 
right? Like, like what, what is the reason why you're trying to play in college? Like you're not just trying to put the name on the front of your jersey and try and win a college world series. You know, you want to, you got to remember that the coaches are people too, right? They go to sleep the same every single night. They wake up the same. They eat food the same. You know, they go about their day similar. Some might be a little bit more disciplined, whatever, but they're, they're human beings, right? And by talking about that, like, these coaches are probably going to see you more than they're going to see their family over the course of a season, which means that they actually have to really like you. So when you're talking to them, it's not an email or a video on Instagram is not going to get you your scholarship because a 95 mile on a fastball is cool. Shooting 40% from the field is cool, but who are you? What if you shoot 40% from the field, but all you like to do is drink every night? Well, then that 40% really doesn't matter whenever we're trying to build a team atmosphere, right? What if you throw 95, but you have no breaking ball? You know, what if you throw 95, but you're complacent with where you're at and don't want to work? It really comes down to the relationship between you and the coach. The coach has to like you. So being present in front of that person often is very important, whether that's a camp, whether that is being at the exact tournaments that they're at. It's how you word your conversation that's very important. And you also have to remember, as much as there's this NIL stuff and scholarship and booster money coming out, like you are a student athlete. Are you going to be a good representation of the college itself? So when you put that jersey on, are you going to represent the school positively? Or are you going to be somebody that's going to taint the reputation of that program? So a lot of these coaches are not just looking for good baseball players or good basketball players. They're looking for good people that – loves, trusts, and respects their parents and appreciates what their parents have provided for them up to this point. They want good students that work really hard in the classroom. They want something that's going to re represent their program very well. We see it in baseball all the time. Week to week, kids will play for different teams. Okay? Yeah. Well, so why is, the tra why is the transfer portal so big? Well, because I didn't like going to Alabama, so now I'm going to try to go to Florida State. Well, I didn't like Florida State, so I'm going to try to go to UNC, right? And it's like, well, if you just watch what the kid did when he was in high school, the parents not only allowed it, but then now you had a kid that played, and I'm talking baseball terms now, you know, five, six, seven different travel teams over the course of yep. two years. What do you think is going to happen when they're not happy in college? They are going to leave. I have so much respect for a kid that's a stud that stays loyal to who he's with. Because you know how many phone calls he's getting about leaving and going and getting money to play travel baseball somewhere else, right? Loyalty is huge. But don't lose sight of the, the relationship and then what you want, like the way you word your questions to the coach, you know, your, your goal is to try and get a phone number and talk to this person on the phone. Get to know them, you know, get to know what they like, get to know what you like. Uh, that's a lot of what these recruiting talks are for anyway, is, is to try and get to know the people that you're trying to recruit. Like, obviously they like you because you're a good talent, but then do they like who you are? You know, so that when you're in those conversations, ask the right questions like, hey, coach, what's your... What's your heading philosophy? You know, what's your offensive scheme for basketball? Um, you know, how do you guys run your playbook in football? You know, it's like, yeah, that coach is probably going to get off the phone and be like, man, he really wants to know a lot about our program. Maybe I got to get him down here so he can see it. You know, like that is a little bit more of a different conversation than just like, hey, coach, I'm really interested in the school. It's been one of my dreams to play for you. Um, I really like the academic program, but my goal is to win a national championship. That's cool. That's surface level, right? But the deep stuff is, what am I going to see on a daily basis if I'm there? You know, what, do you guys do you guys do evaluations for your strength conditioning? Like, is everything individualized? Is it programmed out for the team? Like, how do you guys handle that? You know, what's your philosophy on strength conditioning? You know, and so now you look at it and it's like this coach now has questions that are being given to him that he really has to talk highly about his program. You know, and so you're going to hear a lot about how that guy believes in the program that he's coaching by his answers back to you. And so I think as a, as a player, we get so caught up in like, we put these coaches on a pedestal. We forget that they're humans and we forget to even ask the most important question. Like, how am I going to get better when I'm there? Because if you're a baseball player, it's not going to get drafted out of high school and you want to get drafted. You probably need to develop at the next level. So you need to find out those questions from that coach on how you're going to get there prior to going on campus. Because I think the big transfer portal issue is playing time. So kids don't actually know what their situation is going in. Most of them don't want to hear it, right? And then the second part of it is they don't even know how they're going to develop. So now you don't know what the pitching coach's philosophy is, and then you go to the school and you don't agree with it. You just wasted a whole year at a school and spent a lot of money to go to that school with something that you could have found out in the recruiting process. You know, So I always say, like, do your homework, but a lot of your homework has to be on the phone. 
Um, and the more present you are in front of that coach gives you more opportunities to, to get on the phone with them and, and figure out what they, what they're all about. No, I like that. I, I, it's, it's similar to one of the values we teach our players at BTG is, is curiosity. And so that curiosity is exactly what you're talking about. Asking the, that coach, you know, those are pretty simple questions, right? But I, I can imagine a lot of high school athletes don't ask that, right? It's like, how much playtime am I going to get? Who else is at this position, right? And less about, you know, kind of that really questions that are going to hit on, you know, like, how am I going to develop? Is this person like, I'm I'm a run and gun guy in, in baseball, right? I am, you know, I'm a lefty and I throw 70 miles an hour or 80 miles. I throw slow, but I'm a junk ball guy. Is this a power pitcher, you know, arm, power arm, you know, pitching coach, you know, so really finding that best opportunity for you and you have to be engaged in that process. That process is not going to come to you. It's going to take initiatives. You're probably going to fail. Um, you're going to ask the wrong questions and it's, and it's all the part of the process and we always want to learn. So as we kind of enter the ninth inning and in the, in the last couple of minutes in the fourth quarter of our podcast, um, what would kind of your final pieces of advice be for the parents and coaches that are listening to this to really help impact their athletes and, and get this message across to them? Everybody has a role and the role is different. Parents understand what your role is. Your role is to be mom and dad. And your role is to make sure that your kid is happy. And that should be our main focus because I can vividly remember multiple conversations I had with my mother when I was at school and I was not very happy with my situation and I did not find out the information at first. I bet on myself and worked through it, right? And I have a lot of respect for my coach for giving me that chance. But I, there was a time when I wasn't very happy there. And I can just remember how upset it made my mom because we were very happy when I committed there, but then... Then you go through it. And so, you know, as a parent, like just, just your, your kid's happiness is more important. It's only four years of their life. I know it's a very vital, important four years. I get it. I went through it. A lot of us in here have gone through it, but be a parent first. You know, I know it's, it's very easy to get over top of it and be like, oh, my kid has a chance to be a division one athlete. Let's chase that. I, I, I understand how cool that would be, but what if your kid's going to be happier if he goes somewhere else? You know, and that's where like we kind of have to check ourselves at the door as parents and say, okay, well, what's best for my son or daughter at this time? You know, let me let me make sure that I give them a hug at the end of the night, and that means something. Then you know, us fighting over this whole process because at the end of the day, it's their decision. You know, and let them make the decision that's best for them, and let them learn from it. And sometimes it's going to be hard. You know, but that's the best teacher in the whole world is to let your kid take control of the situation. Right. And just and just teach them and guide them through it. You know, even the financial side of it, just guide them through it. Like, hey, listen, do you really want to come out of school with one hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of debt? I know if I was in your position, I wouldn't. But that's up to you. Right. And I think that's the way that they can have a good experience is if they are in control of the situation, they're going to be a lot happier if they are. They're going to need parent guidance all the time. Right. And for coaches like the, our role is so vital. It's incredibly vital. We are the third parent in that family, you know, and, but we have to also look at it too. It's like, like I said, when I started, I was the guy that was like, everybody's going to play professionally and everybody's going to go to college. And then I mean, those poor kids, you know, that only wanted to make their varsity team, you know, to be around me whenever I had all these kids around me going to college. Yeah, it's cool. We posted it. It was sick. Right. And then it was like, wait a second. That kid that got cut from varsity for three years made his varsity team his senior year. We didn't even post about it. We didn't even talk about it. You know, like as a coach, like just know who you're dealing with. Everybody's situation is different. Everybody is happy based on something different. Just meet them where they're at and be a guide to them. Like I take a lot of responsibility in being educated enough to help the kids and the families. I do. Like, and as this whole recruiting thing has changed, I've had to educate myself a lot. The recruiting calendar changes all the time. How much scholarship money teams are going to have is going to change. The ACC might have 21 scholarships for baseball players in a year, right? It's never been like that. But everybody thinks everybody's getting 35. So as a coach, I do my homework. I got to figure out what's going on because I'm going to have a thousand questions for people. I got to be able to answer. You know, so educate yourself. Provide the best experience for the kids and know what your role is too. Your role isn't to take credit for their work. You know, I am a puzzle piece to their thousand piece puzzle that they have to put together to make it to where they want to go. I am one of those pieces. I'm not the piece. Let them talk about you. 
what I always say too. Like I would love to sit there and just post online that I'm like this greatest person in the whole entire world for like my own feelings, right? But let the kids talk about it. If you really made that big of an impact, you are going to be a part of that conversation, you know, but we don't have to go and chase that. And I think that's something that sometimes myself and other coaches included will fail at as we try and force it on them, you know? And it's like, well, we can't force anything on these kids. Like we just are a piece of it. So be an aid to them, educate, learn, know what they're going to be asking and make sure that you can alleviate this process as much as possible. I love that. So much wisdom that you dropped in this episode. And it's just, this is our responsibility. I appreciate you coming on and sharing the wisdom. And I appreciate all the coaches and parents that are listening to this episode and, you know, taking it upon themselves to take responsibility in their own learning journey and how they can pass that along to the athletes. That's, that's what this show is all about. Um, you know, Ron, I, I do appreciate and for the coaches that are listening, Ron is very accessible. So if you reach out to him, like he, he'll get back to you. He spends time like he really does care about about the kids and, and the kids. He doesn't get an opportunity to, you know, work with like with our BTG athletes. Um, he's really been helpful in, in helping me guide along for, for our business. So, Ron, uh, how can people best, you know, reach out and connect to you? Um, Instagram, website, all that good stuff. Yeah, the best way to reach me personally is is Ronnie Burnick on all platforms, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn, those types of things. But then, you know, if you're interested in anything Hot Corner has to provide, obviously hotcornerathletics.com is a, is a great place. I have an awesome team that, that works there and, and we, we really care about the kids. But for me personally, you know, I'm available on all social platforms and I have a rule with myself. I've got a, a 48 hour rule. I will at the absolute worst case scenario, I'll get back to you within 48. Most of the time it's immediate, but. Um, you know, I try my best to make sure that I, I give you my resources as fast as possible. It's true. He does. <laughs> so appreciate Thank you. you. Thanks for coming Absolutely back on. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and share it with a friend, coach, or parent you feel like would get value from this episode. It's our responsibility to impact as many parents and coaches who are the ones that are impacting our athletes. That's how we create a ripple effect. So thank you for being a part of our community, and we look forward to serving you all next week.